Hello, beautiful community. Let me know if you can see and hear me. And I'm sorry to have kept um, you waiting. It's uh, lovely to be with you on this Sunday. And i um, just going to take your questions. We're going to take a little bit of stock over the fact that we're just into the third year of the war. We'll also, I'm sure, talk about the state of Western democracies. And we're still in the period of days that are the fallout of Putin's assassination of his chief political opponent, Alexei Navalny, and I'm sure we'll get questions about that too. Hi, everybody. Hello, Maria from London. Hello, Anna. Hello, Paul. Uh, you are hearing me, I can see. And that looks promising because that means that we can talk. That means that we can talk. Well, let me just jump upstairs to where the chat begins and pick something. Pool, hi Pool. How much of Russian ideology is historically motivated? I will, I will make sure that at some point um, we do a little bit of a grounding about where we are and where we're going, whether that's via a question or just by me taking a little bit of time to just ground us. So, Paul, you're asking how much of Russian ideology is historically motivated? Well, all ideology manifests in an historical um, context. I suppose what you're asking is how far is Kremlin ideology in a special way um, keen on fetishizing historical memory and distorting historical memory. And there's a good book on this by Jade McGlynn. I think I don't even need to type her in because you, most of you know her. Uh, Jade is uh, a, an expert of the younger generation who, who I particularly strongly recommend. Her book is called Memory Makers. Well, I think the answer to that is obvious. I mean, there is a video on the main channel about Putin's obsession with Tsar Alexander III. And there's definitely the recent evidence of Putin's 35-minute rant at the world via Tucker Carlson about various bits of um, historical um, misinterpretation and interpretation he was keen to share. So, however, to have a serious conversation here, we'd need to ask a, an even more basic question, what is ideology? And in the social sciences, there's a real tendency to just talk about ideology as though it was just the outlook of a particular polity, mm -hmm. the outlook of a particular regime, the outlook of a particular human grouping. I am conservative about taking that off the table because that's how a lot of people talk of ideology is just a general political outlook at hand but i'm also conservative about taking that way of talking about ideology as part of the most serious conversation about ideology that we can have and i'm convinced that there will be a video on the ideology of the Putin regime on, on the main channel in the next few months, because I think it's an important topic. And that'll mean us having to raise the question of what ideology is and whether they have one at all. One of the things we're very grateful to um, have acquired from Marx, Karl Marx, and the series of traditions that came after is a negative conception of ideology. The idea that it's an illuminating way to think about it, which is in itself, of course, not an idea that has anything to do with um, the substantive commitments of Marxism, but we've inherited the idea. It's very important that it's helpful to think of ideology in the negative as something that we are to be suspicious of. So for instance, a cartoonish picture in that direction would be to say that 
ideology, our beliefs you and I have, as that which are distorted by the operation of power relations around us, driven by interests of a particular kind, interests of particular groups. So if I sit here and I say, my word, the most important thing to do about the climate crisis is to recycle. A good question will be, where has that opinion come from? And might it not be a product of the fossil fuel industries? Um, 40 year old enterprise of trying to snuff out systemic conversations about the roots of the problem and focus on individual responsibility. Right? So that will be a, a, depending on how you view the issue, a candidate for um, a, a piece of ideology that um, operates in the air that I've become a victim of. So this kind of suspicious. Um, uh, element is, I think, very constructive to have in mind. Now, just because um, we might be drawn into a somewhat suspicion-driven view of ideology, doesn't necessarily mean that we can do without ideology, doesn't mean that ideology is entirely bad. Um, it may be that it's necessary and not entirely bad, but that there's always an element of illusion to it that is a product of various power relations. Right? I'm not even sharing my views about ideology here. I'm just exploring the, the map to, to, to help us understand that this debate gets very complicated very quickly. So having just gestured very awkwardly in, in these general directions about ideology, let me say something about the shape of the um, imagery um, and ideation that emanates from the Putin regime. I do think that there's a lot of fetishization of historical detail there, a lot of fetishization of memory. But I think that if I had to say something in a, in a nutshell about the Putin regime, it would be about their outlook and potentially their ideology. It would be that it's a combination of quasi-mysticism with an absurd distortion of neoliberalism. Now, let me say, a little bit about the second part because you've heard me talk about the mysticism in, in in the last not very good actually video on the main channel i talked about two mystical elements one's the idea that putin um embodies the the um, collective self-realization of the russian culture and the second element that he has a duty to propel russia from the back row to the front row of nations but at the level of neoliberalism, there's a very weird kind of distortion going on. Now, neoliberalism is not a view, in my opinion. It's um, itself a distortion. It's itself a form of magical thinking. Neoliberalism is cartoonishly the idea that um, the market has primacy for reasons we don't need to articulate. So in my suggested way of using neoliberalism as a tag. If somebody says, I believe the market is better than the state at getting X done for seven reasons, and here they are, that's not a neoliberal position. So for me, neoliberalism isn't about the extent of the primacy of the market. Neoliberalism is about a magical primacy of the market, that the market is simply primary in the way we don't have to talk about. Um, and that idea was enormously powerful in Russia in the 90s. Um, and it was part of this sort of strange subversion of communist-style economic determinism um, by Reaganite-style of economic determinism. Re you know, Reaganism and Thatcherism have a lot in common with Marxism the level of thinking that if you get the economy right, everything else follows. But what the Putin regime has done is taken this further 
and made central not just the idea of market competition, but all competition, right? Including physical competition, uh, including violent competition. And so what you've got is that neoliberalism is a distortion, and then Putinism is a distortion of that distortion. It's a double distortion. And very central ideological items of Putinism involve the idea that might is right, that there is no meaningful distinction between power and authority. If you think that something is authority but something else is power, you're just foolish or not strong enough, don't have enough power, so you have to appeal to authority. And you know, out of this comes this idea that everything can be bought or fought over and gained that way, gained by physical force. Um, so we'll say a lot more, but that's it's it's it's, it's a little bit um, of um, a taste of the ideological background of that regime. Let's go. This was a long introduction. Mika is saying Russian imperialism is totally blind and insane. Fair point, but what I have just said is also important. That Russian imperialism has many features of um, threads in global politics that are actually ubiquitous and universal. So in some ways Russian imperialism is a Russian problem, in some ways it isn't a Russian problem. Is just an extreme manifestation of global problems. You almost saying love from Norway, love back. Hello, Melfitano. SL, Vlad, hi SL. Do you believe that Putin would use nuclear weapons if NATO sent troops to Ukraine and pushed them back to 1991 borders? Well, I think you partly may be referring to Macron's statement about not entirely ruling out the idea of um, troops on the ground. Now, Emmanuel, what troops on the ground? American troops? French troops? Polish troops? Um, do you think Putin would use nuclear weapons if NATO sent troops to Ukraine and pushed them back to the 1991 borders? Let me put it like this. The Putin regime doesn't distinguish between it and Russia. So the most um, basic scenario to think of is when Russia is threatened on their terms. And when Russia is threatened on their terms is when their power is threatened. So um, would is this a regime that would be at a risk that is disturbing to us in extent, able to destroy the world if their power were at risk. Yes, yes. There is an apocalyptic element to this regime. They are more Al-Qaeda than Brezhnev in some ways. So the key scenario for Russian nuclear use, if it is going to be a part of a if you like a bad case scenario nuclear use for them as opposed to some kind of provocation they organize to gain ground on top of other ground they've gained. And that's part of our conversation of a conflict with NATO. Um, but if Russia is badly losing and things are falling apart for them, the key thing to look out for is um, what would be an existential threat to Russia, not on any normal person's conception, but on their conception. Um, and their conception is quite interesting. Um, and what's interesting about it is that all kinds of terrible things could, could happen in, to Russia, which they wouldn't interpret as existential as long as it didn't threaten their power. 
Um, I mean, partly out of that, you see the extraordinary indifference of the Kremlin to, let's say, the regions, um, you know, bordering um, Ukraine um, to the, you know, uh, Russian towns that that um, can, in a limited way, feel the war the way the rest of the country can't. Well. They don't care about that. They're not very motivated to to engage with this. And so, um, we what we've got to pay attention to is that it's their power that's really central to them. And are they are they are they guys who are going to just um, leave if it gets existential and give up? No, they're going to fight. Um, so th th there's a re real risk there. There's a nuclear risk. The other way, of course, if we let them advance as well. So we're in a slight catch-22 situation. So don't buy the story. There is some easy way to alleviate nuclear risk by forcing Ukraine into unsustainable peace deals. That's not, that's not going to work. Mm, let me say a little bit about Macron, maybe, because it's important, and a few, a, a few people wrote in with emails about this. Um, I don't think it's that reassuring to Ukraine to hear that because it's not part of a coherent strategy uh, that one Western leader talks about not entirely ruling out the idea of boots on the ground. Um, because then three or four other voices come along, and that includes Macron himself on another day, who say things that push in the opposite direction. So this sounds like a mess. You also have to be aware that political statements of this kind are significant political acts in themselves and not just words about actions. That's an action in itself to say that. And then questions arise. Um, m might not gung-ho language like that be mm, counterproductive if it's backed up just by... Um, a combination of a lack of strength and a lot of lack of strategy. So you could argue what meaning is there in raising this possibility unless you tell French citizens how this conflict in Eastern Europe is about them and how their security is implicated and given the coherent given the, give a coherent account of how that works and what to do about it. That's absent. The most positive thing I could say about that, I suppose, is that making noises like that, even if they're then flatly contradicted by um, Macron himself or other states people, um, could be part of attempting to put oneself in pole position for a, a better conversation about strategy that hasn't happened yet. Milan from Sofia, hi. Stefan. Saying that, uh, saying that you've emailed me um, with a question. Um, so my policy is that I try to respond to as much um, mail as possible, but given my health, I'm always several months behind. I mean months, not, not days or weeks. Um, but this is a really useful trick to, to, re to, to remind me to increase my chances of getting back to you. Lost prototype. Vlad, if Western conservatives aren't agents of Russia, what are they? They're local political agents. Why is Western conservatism so consistent across multiple countries and seemingly coordinated? So what you've got um, 
is a pathology that many of you have been bored with me talking about on the right. Um, and that pathology is what I would call um, anti-democratic drift. You've got constitutional conservatism from 20 years ago now partly emulating itself and generating a set of um, institutionally destructive uh, political actors who want to break the democratic system. And that movement is partly coordinated. Certainly, um, the Russians try to feed into it, but that they play a minor role in that. And they're not instigators of it. They, it's already really the shape that it was going to have without the Russians, but it's got extra fuel being added by the Russians because they're keen to disrupt our, our democracies. Um, but even more than coordination, what is giving rise to the uniformity across these movements isn't just that these people are talking to each other, they are talking to each other. Um, and they are even talking to Russians. I mean, if you open up the email box of Mr. Dugan, yeah, you're going to see all kinds of very interesting contacts with the anti-democratic right in Europe. But fundamentally, it's social conditions giving rise to this deformation on the right. And our general crisis of trust gives rise to it. Um, you've heard me analyze a little bit the crisis of trust, what factors are behind it. Um, from social exclusion to various ideologies of self-realization to the state of the internet um, to the um, tearing up of certain fabrics that hold communities together, that hold generations together. Um, all of this is a vast assault on the very possibility of even talking in terms of a public good or in terms of solidarity among conflicting citizens. This is a very important conversation that, um, that, that one of these patterns of democratic deformation is this slide on the right. And what it, it comes in two forms. Um, there are other people who do it very consciously, like Boris Johnson. Um, so Boris Johnson is consciously in Ukraine um, on the second anniversary of the war, saying things which undermine US democracy, which undermine British democracy. He's doing that on purpose um, to elevate his profile and you know, serve himself. And it's extremely transparent with Boris. I mean, he couldn't give a hoot about Ukraine. If it didn't advantage him, he would never mention it or never go there. Um, but then there are also, and this is, if you like, my more distinctive contribution to this debate, because this first category isn't something that I've identified for you. Anne Applebaum talks about it, Michael Ignatieff talks about it, endless public intellectuals talk about it. But what, what I pick out on top of that category is a category of politicians who are undermining democratic institutions, but without being consciously intent on destroying them. In other words, they are almost sort of subconsciously drifting into this bracket of the post-constitutional right. And they don't notice that they're doing it. And that is as dangerous. The reason this drift is happening is because this post-constitutional bubble is very advantageous in many ways to operate in. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, rewarding way of exploiting the currents of algorithm-mediated public opinion. And if you are just an entrepreneurial politician, um, you are at risk of drifting in that direction without consciously trying to break anything, you see? So uh, for every sort of um, self-conscious 
destructive post-constitutional conservative. You've got a kind of inadvertent post-constitutional conservative. And then you've got a um, responsible conservative. Um, conservatism is normatively impeccable as far as its democratic credentials go. Um, that's to say about whether it tries to break the democratic game. Indeed, a central feature of conservatism is the sustenance of democratic ritual. So in the British context, for instance, you've got two ex-prime ministers out to break democracy, Liz Truss and Boris Johnson conservative prime ministers. You've got an ex-prime minister like John Major, um, or indeed somebody who's back in the cabinet now, Dave Cameron, the ex-prime minister, um, who, is a, an, who is, in my view, an old constitutional conservative, whatever else you think about him. And then you've got some people... Yeah, so, for instance, it's not completely straightforward where you place Rishi Sunak, the current British Prime Minister, between this category of constitutional conservative and inadvertent post-constitutional conservative. Rishi Sunak is not an, a sort of, um, you know, clearly set intent conscious intent-driven destroyer of democracy. He is nothing like Boris Johnson in that sense. Um, but he might be closer to being an inadvertent post-constitutional conservative than he is to being somebody like Dave Cameron or um, you know, John Major or Theresa May. Um, I could have given American examples in this conversation. Really important topic. Um, and the kind of the, the takeaway tip for this conversation, but also for others about other kinds of drift in other bits of our ideological spectrum um, is watch out for people who are out to break the democratic system, whether they're from the, the wherever they come from, left, right, or center. Watch out for whether they're, whether they're out to break it intentionally, or whether that is just the consequence of their actions. Patrick. Do you think Russians who oppose the current dictator should vote one of the artificial candidates? Or is it, bad, is it better to ignore the election altogether? I think to some extent it's a personal question. Um, you've got to understand clearly what the election is, which is it's a re-legitimation ritual for the regime. And the point of the election is to make people who are opposed to the regime feel that they're alone. And the point of the election for the depoliticized blob is to make them feel that um, everybody is with Putin and the point of the election for Putin's uh, uh, own regime and supporters is to make them feel that the people are with him. I think that um, the standard recommendation of going but then um, screwing up the ballot so that it can't be counted for Putin is one of the good, is one of the good um, approaches. Um, so um, that's perhaps be, been the the main um, recommendation. Um, spoil spoil your piece of paper, and then you can draw in Navalny's name there or whatever. But you can sp uh, turn up, but spoil it. Um, I am personally not terribly worked up about um, what what Russians do. I think that if I were a Russian citizen or a member of the Russian opposition or felt that Russia was my country, I'd feel differently. I'd get more involved in all of these options. Um, And also, of course, it always raises the question of expressive versus effective politics. I mean, there's some people could just have expressive politics come out on top for them and then say, this just makes me want to throw up and I'm not going to participate in it. And you can debate with them about that perhaps being not an effective thing to do and so on. Jackie. Do you believe Putin made the mistake by creating a martyr out of Navalny over the long term? Possibly, yes. 
possibly slash probably. Um, having said this, this is going to be sort of revealed by history. It won't be revealed in the media in the short term. It'll be revealed in the medium to long term. But it's more than possible that the um, death of Navalny um, will create a constructive politicization on the Russian space that could match, if not exceed, the kind of politicization Navalny himself may have created. One thing to say for now, though, is that the Russian opposition need to not just mourn Navalny and move on. I mean, they're never going to move on because of the significance of, of, of who he was. But um, it's not just about dealing with, with, with the loss and with the legacy. It's also about a process of maturation for them. It's really important for them to use this opportunity to mature politically and get better at what Navalny was brilliant at, which is politicizing the Russian space, and then also get better at what Navalny was not so fantastic at doing, which is offering um, a deep and meaningful alternative. Some people come over the top of me, um, like the uh, you know economist, um, Mr. Guriev, who has been associated with Navalny's organization, is based in Paris, and, he might say, well, come on, Navalny has made lots of concrete proposals. Um, he has had a public debate about the significance of a more parliamentary political system for Russia. He's produced an outline of an economic policy. So what are you talking about, no alternative? For me, Navalny's programs remained at the level of you know, offering an alternative too much um, about a beautiful Russia of the future that is based on the, the, the West as a civilized world. You're getting a lot of toxic identity politics driven uh, discourse in the internet about Navalny's, all the dumb stuff Navalny didn't say in his career. Most of it is early on in his career, um, which is not so relevant to today, quite frankly, um, the nationalism of, of his early days. Um, but that misses the real problem, which is what alternative was Mr. Navalny offering? Um, that's the real area of, if you like, either criticism or, great, this is what you've done, but here is what else could have been done and needs to be done now. Um, so it's really important to not um, conflate um, the cheap Twitter theatrics with very interesting substantive criticisms of Navalny that the Russian opposition needs to explore. They have been articulated. And we might get deeper into this because I've been looking at a few articles that, you know, around the turn of the war that you've been keen for me to, to read. So we will bring back the format again on the chat channel here where I read something together with you and we use that as an opportunity to enhance our sort of sense of how we engage with um, not just the situation, the politics on the ground, but also with um, sort of discriminating between what's a, what's a good piece and what's a bad piece, what's a, what's, what's a good analysis, what's a bad analysis. Nancy, thank you. Um, Thomas. What is meant by democracy in the Vlad Vexler context? There are two things that straight away um, come up for us. The first is a sort of banal everyday definition, which is, do you have courts that work? Can you vote these damn people out who are in power? Um, is the media muzzled? Is the higher education system muzzled? So basically, do you have functional counter-majoritarian institutions? That is a, a conception of democracy that is very low on um, rich normative and evaluative elements. So some people will still disagree that that's democracy, 
but um, it's as minimal and banal as you can get. So that's that's one definition. Um, that's not really a definition, but it's a set of very basic working expectations that I think are really important. You know, um, is somebody going to come and take you away in the middle of the night? Can you write an article in the newspaper and not get into trouble? Can you stand for political office and have a chance of winning if you uh, just express your opinion? Um, can you challenge the government in court and win, potentially? So that's one element. Counter-majoritarian institutions, if you like. Um, checks and balances. And the second is this richer sense of democracy that is always about our conversation about what democracy is um, and um, how we get closer to it. It's never a place we arrive. It's always a place we explore by engaging with conflicts we have about different conceptions of what a democratic society is, conflicts that are in, in, insoluble, um, that nevertheless bring great meaning to the table, uh, partly because we can find common elements between these divergent conceptions. So there are then, on top of these banal ideas about what a democracy is, these richer ideas of what it is. And on these we disagree, and while disagreeing about what we are, we strive to get closer to them. And that conversation occurring in a rich way is an absolutely central element of the life of a democracy. But to have that conversation, you actually need certain values already in place, um, the absence of which makes the conversation impossible. And these values are solidarity, conception of the public good, um, the sense that in some sense you and I are in the same boat, even if we are citizens who are at opposite ends politically, and a shared sense of fairness. Not sharing the same conception of fairness, but sharing the idea that we should proceed in our relations with each other mediated by the institutions we share in our society. Um, in terms of some conception of fairness that applies to us all, even though what that conception is is something that's itself a matter of political conflict in our society. Miho, did you expect that many people to the on um, to come to the funeral? Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. I mean, these are people who basically said, "Screw it." I could be arrested, I could be permanently harmed by this. Probably won't be, but I could be. And I could be harmed with the delay. Um, my bank account could be frozen, I could become unemployed, and I could... Um, and this is the least important of all, I would say, spend you know 48 hours or two weeks in jail. So if you add to this situation two other conditions that the protest is either permitted or feels safe because the regime is too weak to do anything about it, number one. And number two, there's a crack in the regime, then the, 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 the numbers increase a hundredfold uh, with these two other conditions, perhaps. So... Um, I, I think the turnout was impressive under these circumstances, but it wasn't stunningly impressive. It was just impressive. Because don't forget, um, if you if you Google on YouTube the wonderful Russian young man Roman, I always get the letters mixed up of of um, his YouTube channel. You all know him. Um, NK NFKZ. Um, go to the middle of his um, video about uh, Navalny losing his life and look at how angry and despondent he is. 
that's the reaction of the Navalny generation in Russia. I mean, there are literally millions of people who are feeling um, helpless rage you know, about this. Um, so in that context, it's not that big a number, quite frankly. Um, there's a lot of people sitting at home really pissed who weren't there. What I would say, however, is that there's two things you've got to keep in mind. One is that um, the political murder of Navalny is not going to create politicization in the short term in Russia of, of any great um, substance. But deep politicization can get converted quite rapidly into big politicization when a few factors change. That could change in a matter of three months. Things happen. So if, Russian political culture is not rap, it's not massively that different to Belarus's political culture. It's different in, in, in some very significant ways. Um, but it's not different in, in, in other significant ways. There's nothing magical that says that you can't have massive uh, mobilization in Russia very rapidly. Um, just certain things need to change. There needs to be a crack in the regime and there needs to be a perception of agency that, that there's actually something you can do that'll make a, make a difference and people be happy to take more risks. Um, so the depolitization is deep it won't shift soon, but when it shifts, it could shift massively and rapidly. Jason, one can't, why can't the Europeans defend themselves without the support of the US? Are the Europeans vassals to the US? Um, I do think that, funnily enough, this, this is one of the positions of 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 uh, it's an exploitative position but it's a position of trump's that actually has a lot of justification to it that the europeans that us here we've been not not been paying our way for our security but jason i think what i would say is that we can only get so far by boosting our militaries over the next few years if we just boost our militaries without a European security strategy, um, it's not going to work to organize the security of Eastern Europe, for example, effectively. And it's not going motivate, to motivate us to um, replenish, refresh, improve, um, military capacity, military cooperation across the continent sufficiently with that. So we need a strategy to take good steps forward in terms of investing in our security and not just de being dependent on the United States. Um, but then we also just need a strategy to organize European security. Simply saying we're going to invest more now and we're going to take defense more seriously doesn't solve the security problems only a strategy solves that um so so that's an important um distinction um but at the moment brutally speaking if the us taps out uh no europe will not be able to to sustain ukraine's um battle against the putin the the, the the maniacal imperialism coming from the Putin regime, the United States is absolutely central. And I'd actually tie this to the previous conversation we were having. US democracy is also central. If US democracy is toppled in 2028, let's say, European democracies will begin to tumble too. Um, so we're also very democratically dependent on the sustenance of democracy in the United States and Europe. We're terribly dependent for uh, security. Um, but even when US provides security, it's still security without a strategy. Um, this extraordinary absence of strategy is um, something we're stuck with. 
we can't correct it easily because we need democratic capacity for this, but our democracies are, are in crisis. And it's an expression of a global crisis of depoliticization. I mean, we're not proposing anything for a new global order. The Russian opposition are not proposing anything for a new global order. Ukrainians are not proposing anything for a new global order. And think about this. How desperately essential is it for Ukraine to do this? It's a matter of Ukraine's survival. They're not doing it. We are not doing it. The Russian opposition are not doing it. There's an extraordinary crisis um, of, if you like, normative incapacity when it comes to proposing anything right toward sustainable future security arrangements. Uh, it's a real, real, real crisis. And funnily enough, we're all horrifically bad at um, making inroads into it. So Tevis, was the way 2020 played out in Belarus um, a necessary condition for the war? No. No. Um, Putin's pattern of escalation would have been um, being implemented whether the Belarusian protest was successful or not at getting rid of the agrofuhrer there. Um, so if we go back longer, my own views about a Russian invasion um, began to formulate around 2015, 2016 or so. Now, Ukrainians might say, well, what are you talking about? Russia already started a war with us in, in 2014. But I, I'm talking about a full-scale invasion or some kind of challenge to NATO. Um, and I must say, until you know, sometime before the full scale of invasion, invasion of Ukraine, when that began to be more palpable as, as, as a possibility, I was more, more conscious of the Baltics as a risk um, zone that slightly more than Ukraine. There's a video, I think, from about 2020 on this channel before I was regularly sharing analysis on YouTube. Um, where I, I, I say something about being worried about the Baltics. Um, so no, um, uh, Putin's conception of security became, became locked in with war, gradually. And then Putin took this missionary or mystical turn between 2010 and 2014, which got exaggerated during his during the lockdown period. Um, so there, but I, I mean, I'm grateful for your question about Belarus because Belarus is 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 a is a missing chip here in this whole conversation. I think it's very important, partly because um, change in Russia could be triggered by change in Belarus. Um, partly because we really need to see this as a conflict between a modern democratic republic and um, maniacal imperialist authoritarianism on the ex-Soviet space. And we need to politicize um, the Russian and the Belarusian space always. Um, and that's why I always encourage the idea of also Ukraine doing more to politicize the Belarusian space. These are really important issues. I'm so sorry I'm not getting to most of your questions and I'm so slow. Let's have a look. Alan is saying that uh, Roman 
and if KZ made it to the EU, yeah, uh, Portugal. Cheryl is saying the violin is a flawed hero. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with that, but um, even saying that already begins to um, introduce some risk of treating him like a candy you're trying to buy and not buy. Um, and I'm always very wary of, you know, drifting in that direction. Um, is he a flawed? You know what makes him a flawed hero? Um, and, you see, flawed sounds like there's something very seriously morally wrong with him. Not that he's not being politically effective at at offering an alternative. So, what is that that's so morally wrong? Is it the sandwich comment, or is it his early sort of really ugly nationalism and horrible things he said about Georgia and things like that? Um, I mean, is he flawed? Well, he's flawed if he, you know you want to put him on some kind of pedestal. Um, but you know, some of this dumb stuff he apologized for not enough. Um, he he wrote a letter to Sakashvili from prison apologizing for some of his previous positions and statements. You know, you see. Um, Picking on Navalny for the nationalist stuff is exactly like picking on Azov for the fascist stuff. It's literally the same thing uh, because there's an evolution and the thing is no longer what it was in the past. Um, so you would then need to be consistent about that. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in looking at the Azov battalion in terms of what it was if it's not any longer that, right? Um, so, um, you, see, you see, that's why I'm ad advising that little bit of sort of allergy to this kind of language, flawed hero, you know, um, because it, it almost introduces too much ethics into politics. Um, um, which which actually obstructs the essential political dynamics that need shifting, um, you know. And even with that sandwich stuff, you know, what, what do you want, you know? So um, when Navalny, you know, found out about the annexation of Crimea in 2014, he said that it was um, illegal and unacceptable. And then he was pushed, well, would you give it back straight away? He said, well, no, you can't do that. That's not what... what was he doing there? What was Navalny doing there? Well, what he was doing was he was thinking, okay, my core demographic, or at least the core of my core demographic, he was thinking, would give Crimea back straight away. But as I go like this, and I try to politically engage more of the population, um, it it undermines me to say I'd give Crimea back straight away, um, and undermines my capacity to generate transformation in the Russian space. So what what arises there? A conflict between ethics and politics. The ethics says tell for goodness sake that it's Ukrainian straight away, goodness sake, but the politics says no, don't say that. There's a conflict there, and. You know, what do you expect a political animal to do? Um, he's gonna he he's gonna say, yeah, yeah I need to hedge this. Um, um, I suppose you could then say, well, no, you anticipate that the war is coming, and then you know a time will come where you'll have to anyway say it needs to be immediately given back. That's a good point. 
But then the point could be, well, what if the Putin regime could collapse before then? You see, you shouldn't overly ethicize that process. And in that very interview, Navalny says that, you know, this is um, um, whatever he's called it, imperialist chauvinism that just, just is counterproductive for us. Um, so, yeah, and let, let me just say something personal. It's completely irrelevant, but let me just say say this personally. If I were to relate to Navalny like the frivolous identity politics driven Twitter uh, wash of activist theatrics relates to him, which is to say as a political candidate for their local area in, <laughs> in Britain or in Germany, I dislike him. I, he's very likable personally, actually, but, but I dislike him. I don't want, I wouldn't vote for Navalny, I'd vote against Navalny. If Navalny was running, for the, in the Tower Hamlet seat in East London, I'd vote against him. But the, the point is that's not what's being offered, you know? you know. Do you like Lionel Messi? No, why not? I don't want to live with him. Well, nobody is offering for you to live with Lionel Messi. Um, you know, do you want to watch Messi at a stadium? And do you want to watch Messi on the television? No, I don't, I don't like football. Okay, fine, then don't. But don't confuse that question with, do you want to live with Lionel Messi? Nobody's offering that. Nobody's offering anybody to vote for Navalny. Um, he is um, he is a, um, uh, you know, uh, a particular kind of political agent with extraordinary qualities and um, down downsides. He's doing something. The question is, does it serve us? Um, and that basically means, is he politicizing the Russian space constructively towards a more benign kind of politics? And is he offering an alternative that is constructive and, 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 and benign? And here, you know, my assessment is 50-50, yes on one, no on the other. Um, I did this because this is just so repetitive and we keep washing ourselves over and over in the same discourse. Um, I've been asked to read a piece, actually, that's really critical of Navalny, and I may do that on the chat channel as one of our readings. Um, and this is actually matches with, with Cheryl's point. FF is asking, what type of anti-Putinesque persona can galvanize the Russian populace? No, this is this is this is not about a persona. This is about proposing an alternative. And this is about systemic change. And it's also about decolonization. Um, so what you don't want is um just a democratic person. If you put a democratic person into this kind of system, they'll not be a democratic person seven Tuesdays from today. Um, but if I frame your question less in terms of personality and more in terms of political substance, the political substance of the personality, if you like, not not the charisma of the personality then I would say it's somebody who can offer a, 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 a real alternative. Somebody who says, um, here is how to reform NATO to guarantee security on the East European space. Um, and here is how Russia plays into it. And here, you know, dear Russians, listen to me. Um, dear liberal Russians, here is my proposal, but also I have a proposal for the, the um, you know, other citizens who, who are not fanciers of liberal democracy. I have a proposal for them, for their well-being, for their safety, uh, for their meaningful participation in the polity. I have a proposal. Um, this proposal is about this particular model of decentralization. I also have a proposal for the army. This is how I'm going to restore the army and make it a great institution, right? I mean, you can you can sit in a cafe in Vancouver and say, ban the Russian army. Well, that'd be nice, but how are you going to do that? So um, you also need concrete proposals by the Russian opposition, which I'm afraid they're not doing, um, 
two institutions that, that they they don't love talking about, like the Russian military, you know? And here you can use Putin's insane imperialism and try to leverage it. Look, our army is engaged in evil imperialist insanity. Insanity! It's just killing our neighbors. H how is that making our military great? You know? So they need to, to, to engage in that kind of politicization. Lots of rants in this Q&A today. Jacob is saying, um, I've messaged you on Patreon. I'll get back. I, I'm aware that I'm behind just because my health has been so crap recently. Um, but yes, you're quite right. I do everything myself at the moment. Um, and I haven't um, I haven't yet um, outsourced anything. But I'll have a look at your message with, with gratitude. Gen consensus is saying Vlad says 25% of the Russian population um, um, uh, oppose Putin and the war, while 50% is a blob that doesn't care. I don't think the answer is doesn't care. Uh, the answer is they're positively resistant to politics. That's very different to not caring. Um, but I always believe Many more people oppose Putin, what a change. So the most important thing to not get wrong there is that there is no such thing as public opinion in a radically depoliticized group of the population. It's not that they have an opinion and they are holding it in private. It's that participation in politics is what's going to lead them to form an opinion. It's that way around. So it's a mistake to go around wondering, what do the Russian people think? What do the Russian people think? They don't think anything. Um, when it comes to that depoliticized blob in the middle, they do not have public opinions. And they are very, very, very actively mobilizing against political mobilization. Misty is saying more constructive, less, less, less expressiveness. I do think there's room for expressive politics. I think expressive politics is very important. What I criticize is um, expressive politics that pretends it's constructive. So, for example, if I'm Ukrainian and I say, I am allergic to this Navalny guy because he has said some dumb things stuff about um, my country I don't like. He said that sandwich, sandwich. Okay, fine. You, you Ukrainian, you, I mean, you're, you're on the wrong end of a, of a brutal imperial invasion. You're an innocent, innocent victim in this situation. You're entitled to think whatever you, you want. But you can't then claim that that's constructive politics. It might be constructive in the sense that it serves one in the Ukrainian informational environment to recite that stuff. But it's certainly not constructive politics to, to say Navalny is irrelevant. He's, a, he's one of the chief politicizers in the Russian space. Um, so um, that's the problem, right? There's no problem with Ukrainians saying, I hate Navalny. There's a problem with the Ukrainians saying, I hate Navalny, and that's a really constructive political position I've adopted. Um, you can have the right to say, you know what? 
I don't do constructive relationship to Mr. Navalny at the moment. It's just not me. And then we say, okay, fantastic. Let's ask the next, next person in Ukraine. Maybe they'll feel the same. Maybe they'll feel differently. That's fine. But it's the conflation of expressive politics with constructive politics that um, I call out. The big cat, evil imperialist insanity is a great description. It's it's a bizarre attempt to just the present into the past, often into a past that never was. And it's a kind of extreme allergy to the um, contemporary situation in the world. And they feel that not just about Ukraine, that they feel that about much of the world. Um, and they want to shove Ukraine into the pre-2014 period and into the 19th century. Um, this is extreme intolerance of just contemporary reality. And 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 you know, I don't love calling things mad, but there's obviously a derangement and a, and a very destructive. Um, dynamic to that attitude. How do we get politicized again if we're depoliticized? Um, depends on where. Um, as I say, for the Russians, it's a crack uh, at the top plus leadership and the proposal of an alternative that goes a bit beyond living like the beautiful, wonderful West. Um, I have to say I'm conflicted about this. Because um, there is no point just to bash on the Russian opposition when they're themselves struggling to find their feet. But it's been two years, and maybe we can do better than the beautiful West. Because even that proposal is un ambiguous. Like, what, what, which West? Right? Like, what do you want to take from the West? What do you not want to take from the West? Um, the West also contains quite different political and economic models in some ways. Um, so, you know, we, we need that. Roz, hi, and thank you. Um, and happy Sunday. Is there any real hope of ending this war without turning into a large NATO war? It seems like the hope of a positive outcome for Ukraine is slowly slipping away. I think I think it's really important to ask the big questions. I think this community in particular is at risk of microdosing or gamifying itself on the war. That's to say, um, Ukraine shoots down seven Russian planes, big explosion here, small explosion there, um, and that can often blind us to the the, the, the big picture. Um, the big picture is that at the moment the Kremlin fancies they can win this um, and they don't feel they're losing at the moment. Um, they feel that winning doesn't necessarily mean taking over all of Ukraine, um, but it means the perpetuation of the war or a peace deal that can be a means of them continuing the war uh, more effectively later, matched by some possible provocation elsewhere, maybe against NATO. So that's their thought. Um, they think that with every sort of half a year that passes, the situation gets better for them because they're so dogmatically convinced about our decline. Wrongly, I mean, 
our decline is there, but it's not as definitive as inexorable as they're making it out. And they have a sort of theology about it, dogma about our decline, and that's not that's not real. Our decline is a contingent historical dynamic, and it's um, also heavily mitigated by the extraordinary institutional resilience of Western democracies. We're battering our own democracies at the moment, but their institutions are often very resilient. That's where the Russians are. Ukrainians are in a very difficult situation whereby they are existentially reliant on support that is completely caught up in the domestic politics of allies. And Ukraine is also in the middle of a very big challenge of adjusting from a short-term to a long-term war. Um, and that's going to come with more conflict, with more politicization, and more resentment of the government by, by Ukrainian citizens um, for not delivering, for not solving problems enough, for not having a strategy, blah, 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 blah. And we in the West, if Biden gets re-elected, are on a dynamic of continuing to support Ukraine with ups and downs, but a general trend toward diminution of support. And so I don't think any of this puts Ukraine's survival in the short term at risk. But it certainly creates a very big risk of an unsustainable peace being forced on Ukraine. And if anything, an unsustainable peace may be the primary scenario we're heading for at the moment. I do think that there are quite a few contingencies. Um, you know, the Putin regime is stable today, but things happen. I mean, we witnessed the Prigozhin rebellion and you know, it, it's a regime that is uh, stable until it's not stable. Something could change a year or two from now. Um, but we're in a difficult situation and we do not have the resources to dramatically change our sort of absence of strategy. If I'm honest with you, and I want to be more aspirational than this, but I think that we can fix our strategy problem by a degree of 20%. I think we don't have a strategy. I think we can develop 20% of a strategy with better communication, better leadership, um, and a direct engagement by Western leaders with their voters about what's up, which honestly means speaking to you know, Canadians, Americans, Brits, Germans, what's in it for us? How are we affected by this? Um, um, you know, how do we understand this uh, challenge in terms of our own security? And what are we going to do about it? So I do think we can make significant inroads into a lack of strategy. But what I do not see is democratic capacity to simply fix the strategy, which is why I see so many um, experts writing lovely pieces about just galvanizing ourselves and taking on this challenge. But it's not about galvanization. It's about um, more than just sort of moral willpower. It's about um, having a political environment that is healthy enough to be propitious to um, constructive proposals for a, a sort of a reimagined global order. And so that's tough. Um, and so I don't think we fix this problem to any degree, really, um, unless we address the global challenges we face. I don't think you can fix the the Ukraine problem, Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine, without talking about European security and global security more widely. Um, and you know, we're in trouble with that. We're in trouble with that conversation. Um, and we're 
we, we also do have some problems with moral willpower too, but I just don't think they're central. Um, and an aspect of the moral willpower problems is just a quality problem in politics. We've got to, we've got a deterioration just in sheer quality terms of um, uh, our political leaderships. Um, so, you know, w w whatever you think of um, the prime minister of this country, for example, where I am, Rishi Sunak, um, he, he's not a, he's not a, he's not a political figure of any weight. Um, and that's a problem too. But as I say, I don't think that is, you know, I, I don't think that is central. So we're drifting toward the West little by little, but not entirely abandoning Ukraine. Um, not to a degree of Ukraine than just being um, forced to, you know, disappear of the map. That's that's not a, a risk at the moment. Um, but an unsustainable peace without Western security guarantees is a risk. Um, so that's to say Ukraine giving up very significant territories in some kind of an unsustainable peace deal that for Putin is just a a technique for winning the war later on and that ukraine being forced into that um, without western security guarantees um and that is one of the realistic scenarios at the moment it may even be the primary scenario we're heading for um and i don't think we have to land there even with our incapacity we could do better than that um no so that's kind of how I see it, I think. Um, I think that we should hope that within our limitations, we can do better and that that better is good enough um, to at least develop um, some picture of European security that is a, a bit more coherent and a bit more coherently entertained between European elites. And to bring about a situation where Ukraine isn't forced into a flawed peace without security guarantees. I, mean, I think that is realistic. Um, and I think that's worth fighting for. Relative time works. Looking back, was the Prigozhin Pr rebellion uh, what was it in actuality? Was it anything wider than one man's ego? Um, so it's Prigozhin losing his stuff due to the extremity of his activities, due to the intensity of war. What he did was remarkable and unremarkable. It was remarkable insofar as he offered the single most systematic critique of the Putin regime, I think, that anybody has offered since the beginning of the war, which is obviously a problem for the Russian opposition because they should have been doing that. But it's a critique that went um, across different um, potential modes of objecting to Putin and focused on something that was a thread going going across all of these different modes of objecting to Putin, which could include both the liberal democratic objections and the hard ultra-nationalist objections, um, which was about, as Greg Uden argued uh, usefully when he analyzed Prigozhin's discourse about competence. Prigozhin said, whatever you guys do, you can't do it. You're fighting a war, you can't fight the war. You're trying to stop a war, you can't stop a war. You know, whatever you are embarking on, you're ineffectual, ineffectual. And that resonated because that resonates beyond just a particular demographic. So that's what's, what was sort of remarkable about Prigozhin. What was unremarkable was he didn't match that up partly because he didn't see himself really as a revolutionary he's a sort of a um 
he, he was terrified to have found himself in as revolutionary position as he found himself in. But then what was missing was a proposal for an alternative, right? So what was missing from Navalny, I'm not comparing a, somebody who stands for democratic institutions and, and, and freedom with, with um, um, you know, s s somebody who is an, an entrepreneur of the darkest arts of human destruction. Um, but um, in a way, both were missing, and Prigozhin even more so was missing any kind of plan. Um, so if he released a, a, a plan for a future, here's my plan for the army, here's my plan for end the country, here's my plan for a, a future of the war, um, here's my plan for the Russian political system, and he, his convoy were bigger, and he had that alternative vision, uh, it could have gone really badly. Because I, I can tell you, um, even that little convoy that was heading for Moscow, people in Moscow were not confident that it would be stopped. The response of the state and the response of parts of the regime was, okay, let's just let's just let's just hide and see what happens here. Um, so again, back to Navalny's funeral, the number of people who would positively come out for Putin should not be overestimated. When um, you know uh, the chips are really down, um, Putin. Um, he 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 doesn't have many people who are going to put themselves on the line for him. Okay, ten more minutes. Domagoy is saying, Aristovich was saying that Ukrainians don't want to fight. I, I don't follow Aristovich closely at the moment. Um, I'd be surprised if he said that, to be honest. So I'm not disbelieving you, but I, I wonder what the context is. Um, uh, the justification for Putin's invasion remains... Um, now, look, I, I, I'm somebody actually who... Um, is very conservative about the term genocide. I don't actually think genocide occurs unless there's a vertical instruction. And I, we, we're going to have a video probably on the main channel about genocide. There's a vertical instruction for physical destruction of a large proportion of a human grouping of a particular kind um, that is not far from a desire to eliminate that group physically. Right. That is very different to the genocide convention. Um, don't think you can just go around citing the convention. The term genocide is a political construct. Um, so I'm very slow to say that the genocide is happening anywhere in the world. But the Kremlin's discourse during this war has been genocidal um, about the non-existence of Ukrainians, unreality of Ukrainians. And so... Um, there's no way in hell you're not going to want to fight against that. I'm sorry. Um, when that's coming your way and trying to take you over. On the one hand. On the other hand, do Ukrainians have very different views, depending which part of the country you're talking about? Yes, they do. Are Ukrainians increasingly asking questions about their government? Yeah. But they're not questions about, we don't want to fight. They're questions about, well, you know, you, you are... Um, at the moment coming and you, you, you're able to um, um, position the population in whatever way you need for, for the war. You're taking parts of the population. 
you're using their health, using their their lives. Are you doing enough in return? That that's that's more like the conversation. Um, at the level of mobilization, if that's what you're asking, Ukraine's having a problem with mobilization. Um, I think that as a philosopher, I'd pick I'd pick on two key aspects here. First of all, this is not the First World War, the Second World War. Uh, we've got very different human beings. Um, if Britain is invaded, uh, the number of people who would want to fight as opposed to just migrate to Iceland um, is going to be much higher than it was back then. So there's also just the, 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 the nature of a modern human being. Um, in, in, in modern conditions, we could sociologically describe in various ways. We could talk about that another time. The second thing, though, is that Ukraine is in the middle of transitioning from a short-term to a long-term long war footing um, in its domestic politics. And the questions arise, well, you know, if the government can engage with the population in a certain way for a couple of years, um, is that sustainable for five years? Or do they need to be, does there need to be a change? And I do not comment very explicitly on Ukrainian politics because I think ethically I try to stick to certain models of expertise that um, means you don't talk. So that's why my policy is to only tell you 10% of what I know about Ukraine. Um, because if I told you 100%, um, I'd be talking about things that other people know more about than me, and that'd be uh, I'd not be putting first-rate material into your tummies that way, and I'm against that. But what I would say is that can you talk to a population about mobilization for five years the way you talk to them about it for two years? And I think my answer is no. So I think that one of the challenges for the regime that it hasn't come to meet yet is how do you talk about mobilization um, in a way that is more compelling and more enticing and more realistic vis-a-vis -a, -vis a long term conflict. Um, maybe you could get away um, existential war duty, you got to do it for two years, but you need deeper and richer and more visionary enticements um, during a longer war. Jay Ganev, do you think the exploding of hyper-identity politics and woke ideology over the last seven or eight years was an absolute gift for Russian propaganda? Um, so my view is that this is a real phenomenon. It's not made up. It is a major threat to Western democracy, hyper-identity politics. But I also believe that there's a counter-revolutionary wave against it of an authoritarian anti-democratic kind that is even more dangerous than the identity politics itself. So we're in a mess because we've got this really bad problem and then our solution to it is an even worse, more destructive problem that is washing away that first problem. Um, so that's a mess in which to be. The main thing, if you want to send the Russian perspective on this, is that Russia is not Poland. Cultural, conservatism, family values, all of that stuff, when it emanates from the Kremlin, it's not real, it's BS. It's BS. So Russia's extreme cultural conservatism is propaganda for the West. It's not real. They don't believe it. And you know, they're really people in the West who are deeply troubled, sometimes justly or sometimes unjustly triggered by various bits of identity politics. Um, Putin isn't deeply triggered by that. I mean, Putin isn't even deeply homophobic. Um, 
So this is made up stuff. And Putin's talk, now there's a lot to talk about when it comes to you know, balancing the rights of trans people with the rights of other groups that their rights might clash with in the West. Um, very important conversations to have about elevating the rights of trans people, but also um, engaging with what might not be right with trans discourse. You know, the Kremlin's relationship with this is completely manipulative. It's entirely propaganda-based. Um, and, and when uh, people like Tucker Carlson sort of elevate the cultural conservative contribution that Russia might have to make, um, it's total bullshit. And the way the Kremlin sell this is by saying we are more Western than the West. We are real conservatives. Um, and the West has degenerated into all kinds of insanity and nonsense. Um, but it's not real. Um, Russia is a society low on traditional values, low on family values, and low on religion. So we just got to see through that crumb, crumb and propaganda. Don't don't let that complexify sort of our own challenges that we're having with our conflicts and discourses. The Kremlin's trying to exploit this. And no, it's not just a very culturally conservative country expressing that. It's propaganda. Kevin, thank you. Seb, thank you so much. My pleasure to keep up the keep up the conversation. Let's see if we can find one more, more question. Moldy is saying, I still don't get it, what you mean by a strategy. We'll come back there. I think it's a fair question. Bulwark is saying the West must show its teeth. Um, yeah, Putin is reactive to weakness. Um, Zonko is asking the last question of today's chat. Um, Hi, Vlad. What role do you think... Um, thank you, Sandy. Um, <laughs> looks going to be deceiving, though. Um, Hi, Vlad. What role do you think immigration has played in the crisis of trust in Western democracies? Well... Immigration has played less of a role in the crisis of trust in Western democracies than it will yet play with the massive climate-mediated migrations we're going to see that are going to pose an existential threat to Western democracies. A lot of um, the more apocalyptic climate discourse and climate activists talk about societal collapse in the West. I don't see that myself. I don't recognize that as likely or even remotely likely. But what I, I do see societal collapse in some parts of the world due to the climate crisis. I don't see that in the West. What I do see is a risk of climate-mediated democratic collapse in the West over the next 50 years. So I am a, a sort of a democratic warrior about the climate crisis, not a societal collapse warrior about it in the West. So whatever we've experienced is going to be is going to be a much 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 more dramatic challenge. Here is one thing that I would say, somewhat parenting my beautiful colleague Michael Ignatiev. Um, the human rights driven migration discourse is dead. In the nineties, you could justify a generous migration policy in human rights terms. And I think that has simply ceased to work. Um, voters um, are no longer going to hear that. So 
what Michael Ignatiev proposes instead is a kind of language of the gift. So it's not these people can come in because it's their human right, but these people can come in because it's our choice to welcome them. And that is um, much less triggering of citizens who are concerned about um, elites. They're scared. They don't understand imposing policy solutions on them. One of the things that I then add on top of this thought from Michael is that one of the worst sins of progressive politics today is to pretend you've won arguments you haven't won. And it is deeply toxic in a democracy to proceed that way. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, my personal voting record on migration policy, if you can tie my voting record to migration policy, which is not the central issue I vote on, um, would be a voting record that is tied to migration policies that are a lot less generous than my own personal disposition is. As it happens, my own personal disposition is that if you took my whole street and you replaced it with um, folks fleeing huge challenges in Africa and the Middle East, I'd be in love. I think the, the street would be alive and wonderful. But the reality is that we have to start with the actual feelings of voters, not the feelings we would like them to have. And I see a lot of progressive dismissal of the actual feeling of voters as though they're just uh, you know, ignorant and they need to wise up. Well, no, I'm sorry. We've got to start with what they actually feel. And this creates a very different political priority that progressives get wrong. We can't bring in people into the country and then persuade the population that um, Dan is saying they're not ignorant, they're evil. If that's about um, voters who want uh, a very tough, brutal migration policy, then no, you can't call them evil. They're your fellow citizens. So, because... Um, if you completely pretend that a fellow citizen isn't a citizen, then that's as bad as whatever they're doing. Okay? So you become a hypocrite. You become a democratic hypocrite. You smash democracy, right, while criticizing others for smashing it. But what I say is that the priority has to be different. You persuade the population first, and then you bring people in. And if you haven't persuaded the population, you can't bring people in. Um, that's a very different order to how progressive discourse occurs. And that's painful because what am I bringing out here? I'm bringing out here a conflict, actually, between human rights and democratic sustenance. So what I'm saying is that in the West today, an immigration policy, let's, let, let's be real, by the way, here. Do you know how much brutality there is in the policies of Western states around others coming into them. Do you know how, how tough it is for people, right? Um, we've got massive human rights challenges in that department. But fixing these human rights challenges really hurts our democracy. It's not a conflict you can, in an infantilized way, abstract yourself out of by saying, no, 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 the other voters, they are not ethical and I am. You can't do that. Obviously, you can. Obviously, you, you can, you just did, you can, but, but, but you're not going to be effective, right, at, at doing that. So we've got a conflict because um, a, a human rights-friendly migration policy undermines trust in democratic institutions. The, the, the democratic institutions that generate a human rights-friendly migration policy um, are going to be institutions whose trust is degraded in the eyes of most Western citizens. And that is one of the big conundrums, one of the five or 15 conundrums that Western policy faces today, and we'll keep talking about it, but it's a very, very difficult conflict. 
anything remotely decent and civilized hurts democracy, uh, undermines trust in, in parliaments, undermines trust in public institutions, um, undermines trust in media institutions. So this is a very difficult conflict. And I'm sad to say that there is no sort of magical solution we can do to snap out of it. So that was the last question. Unless, unless there's a Sean who wants to ask another question. We can take one more. We can take one more. Go on, throw it again. Okay, I've got it. Uh, hey, Sean, I'm a black American and a vet, veteran. I guess my concern is when people talk about hyper-identity politics here in the States as used as a method to downplay a lot of the actual problems. So um, it's a really important question. And let me just make a kind of a sociological observation about my own comments on hyper-identity politics. Obviously, my criticism of hyper-identity politics does not come from the right or doesn't come from the cultural right. Um, so let, let me put something bl blank on the table. It's possible to be critical of um, certain kinds of hyper-identity politics without being without downplaying the causes underneath those so for instance it's possible to ask how far is black lives matter constructive political movement it's very important to ask that question and there are some circles in which you can't ask that question but there are two positions that are available uh, there's, there's a constellation of two positions that is entirely available i don't want to recommend that now because it's I'm not here to recommend views too much anyway, um, but I'm just going to say they're consistent. It's consistent to think BLM is as unconstructive as it is constructive, and also think that not only is racism a big challenge in US society, but that the kind of challenge that racism is in U.S. society is what you might call a, a constitutive or systematic challenge. Right? And one of the problems on the right, often in the United States, um, when issues of racism are downplayed, is that you put on the table the question of racism as blank sort of legalized exclusion and when you then say that that's not really the main thing that's going on, you think there is no racism. But the, 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 the chief kind of racism in the United States is, in my view, a racism of deprioritization. Right? So what I want to do is separate these two questions, questions of, about the constructiveness of certain identity political movements is um, uh, the questions about the constructiveness of these movements. Um, are separate from questions about the depth of the challenges they try to address. Um, and my view would be to um, be very serious about the depth of the challenges. Um, I do think we've got systemic issues with, 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 with race and racism. But it doesn't follow that um, uh, our identity-driven mobilization around this um, is a constructive enterprise. Um, so that would be um, that would be my comment. And one of the things we are missing very much in our culture is a healthy conversation about what might be wrong with hyper-identity politics that isn't just a kind of um, conservative and often anti-democratic attempt to just wash over it and... Um, uh, 
substitute it, quite frankly, with an even bigger problem. Um, let me, um, I can give a, a, a direct example here without going into, into detail. Um, Ron DeSantis is not just anti-woke. He is part of a counter a, a, a counter revolutionary movement against woke um, that poses itself a democratic threat and has been shown to pose a demo threat, democratic threat in the field of higher education and so on. So I think this is a very, very important conversation. Um, and we've got to explore issues around hyper identity politics um, that are visible to people uh, you know, across the whole spectrum, um, um, left, center, right. Um, and uh, I, I think that I have some optimism about that, that happening. I mean, I'll just put something else on the table. One of the things that's significantly missing from um, a lot of the social justice movements in the West is the role of class-based structural disadvantage. Um, uh, so there. So these are these are some of my comments. Um, I hope they're constructive. I'm very grateful to have had you all with me today. Um, King Kong is saying that they're a hard right conservative and they left my channel. <laughs> well, okay, final, 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 final comment. It's very important to understand that people come to the table of politics with very different ideas, with very different ambitions, with very different values. And it's very important that we keep sitting at the table of politics together as long as possible. And my own personal policy is only to evict people from that table if they do something really extreme like threaten violence. So everybody, lots and lots of love. Thank you very, very much for being uh, with me and talk to you all soon. Happy Sunday.